Without further ado, therefore, um, I shall introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr David Walsh. David is Program Manager, Public Health Program Manager at the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, where he's worked since December 2006. He's also an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. Within the Glasgow Centre, David has led a very substantial research programme aimed at understanding Scotland's and Glasgow's levels of excess mortality and the reasons for that excess mortality. He's also looked at deindustrialisation and at comparisons of health across European regions and a wide range also of other topics to do with health inequalities. Um, I know as someone who's worked with him, this is um, a body of work that David presents with astounding clarity, um, which I think hides the degree of complexity um, and industry that lies behind what he's going to present. Um, I know you'll enjoy hearing from David. He's a fantastic speaker. And please join with me in welcoming to the podium. Thanks very much. Uh, it's nothing like a big build-up to fall flat on your face. Uh, thanks, Carol. Thanks to the college for the invitation. I'm always very happy to come along and start people's day by talking about death. Uh, and speaking of which, this is the title of the talk I was given. Um, an alternative title, but one which less easily rolls off the tongue and perhaps less easily attracts an audience, uh, might have been uh, this one, History, Politics and Vulnerability, Explaining Excess Mortality in Scotland and Glasgow. And I've put this up just because this is the title of a report we published last year, which is the basis for a lot of what I'm going to talk about. And specifically what I'm going to talk about in the next 25 minutes is to give a very quick overview of Scotland's and Glasgow's health, i.e. to depress you. Uh, a lot of this will be familiar to many of you, but apparently not to everybody, so for that reason I've kept it in. But it's mercifully brief, I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes on that. And equally briefly, uh, I'll define what I mean by this idea of excess mortality, unexpectedly worse mortality. And then the main part of the talk is really to focus on what we did for that report, which was from an assessment of a huge amount of evidence, uh, we came up with two, uh, what we refer to rather grandiosely as explanatory models, i.e. what are the main contributory factors to this worse than expected health. And there, is, there was two models, one for Glasgow, one for Scotland, but I'm going to talk about Glasgow today. It's worth just saying that that report is, was less of a project and more a kind of synthesis of many years of research and many individuals' research. And the evidence relating to excess mortality has been published in 25 different journal papers, I think, 10 major reports, and has been the basis for at least five PhDs. Why am I saying that? Because it begs the question, can I feasibly present all that to you in a 20-minute slot at a conference? To which the answer is a very, very confident no. Uh, in the words of my annoying teenage daughter, how does no hit your jaw? For those streaming from outside Scotland, you may be slightly confused, don't worry about it. So the point is, I'm going to give you very, very edited highlights today of what's a much longer, more complex story. And I'll do it fairly quickly as well to try and cover it. But I'm reasonably confident that it will make uh, some sort of sense. So as a very quick bit of background to this in terms of Scotland's and Glasgow's health, what do we think of? Well, we might think of lots and lots of things, but one of the things in public health we tend to think of are headlines like this, the sick man of Europe. This is a frequently used headline in the Scottish media. And the interesting thing about it is that unlike just about anything else in the Scottish media, it is of course true in that, as you all know, that uh, life expectancy in Scotland is lower than in any other Western European country, and that's true for males and also for females. As many of you will also know, part of the explanation for this relates to a much slower rate of improvement over time. So this particular graph shows long-term trends in male and female life expectancy going all the way back to the middle of the 19th century with every red line, one of the main Western European countries, so England, Spain, France, whatever. And if I show Scotland's trajectory, the two points worth noting are, first, as the title of the slide says, Scotland has not always been the sick man of Europe. From the middle of the 19th to about the middle of the 20th century, life expectancy here was actually on a par with a whole number of other Western European countries. But it's what's happened in the last five or six decades or so that's the point whereby things have continued to improve but have improved more slowly than elsewhere, meaning that by the end of the period we are in this position of being the so-called sick man of Europe. And part of the explanation for this low comparative level of life expectancy is, of course, that we have the widest health inequalities in Western Europe. Uh, I could show lots and lots of different measures to show that the gap between rich and poor is wider here than elsewhere. This happens to be a particular one for middle-aged females from a particular study, but the point is that the gap in health terms between rich and poor is wider here than elsewhere and that obviously brings down the overall level of life expectancy in the population. 
And moving to Glasgow, well, uh, Glasgow is, of course, Scotland's largest city, and it's also the city with the lowest life expectancy um, in the country. And even when you make more meaningful comparisons, say, with cities across Europe that have also experienced similar sit um, histories of deindustrialisation, Glasgow still um, comes out very badly, all of which leads to appalling coverage in the media, like this one from a few years ago in the BBC, and talk of uh, whether there was a so-called Glasgow effect, and I'll rant about that just in a few minutes. Uh, but despite the appalling nature of this particular article, it is asking a relevant question, which is why? What's going on? And the traditional explanation for poor health in Scotland generally has always focused absolutely correctly on higher levels of deprivation linked to processes of deindustrialization, the impact on society on the, of the loss of so much industrial employment over many decades. And it's important to emphasize, maybe not for this audience, but for more generally, is just what a massively important explanation that is. As you all know, poverty and deprivation are the main drivers of poor health in all societies, be that Glasgow, Scotland, or around the world. And poverty impacts impacts on health in a whole number of complex ways in terms of increasing levels of stress, which as you know is a risk factor for a number of chronic diseases, but also importantly in the way that people respond to poverty in terms of coping mechanisms around the use of alcohol, the use of drugs and impacts on other adverse health behaviours. So it's a massively important explanation, but the problem has been that when it came to Scotland's particular poor health profile, it's been an insufficient explanation. And that's because lots and lots and lots of research has shown that even when you take into account differences in poverty, poverty and deprivation, there remains a higher level of mortality that has in effect been unexplained. And this is the definition that we are using of excess mortality. Higher mortality in Scotland compared to the rest of Britain over and above that explained by differences in deprivation. And this worse than expected mortality is seen everywhere in Scotland, but is greatest in and around Glasgow and the West Central Scotland. So for example, one study we did a few years ago, which compared Glasgow with the English cities of Liverpool and Manchester, showed all three cities to be very, very similar in a number of important regards, including their current socioeconomic profiles. And yet, despite that, the health profile of Glasgow is completely different, with premature mortality a, 30, a whopping 30% higher. And actually, you can take those five bullet points and summarise them quite neatly in one chart, by which if you plot a measure of poverty on the x-axis and a measure of how long people live on average on the y-axis, and you throw in some of the main UK towns and cities, the tragic truth of the matter is that the greater the level of poverty in society, the younger on average people will die. The issue for Glasgow and the issue for us in trying to understand this is why Glasgow is such an outlier. And especially when in the earlier part of the 20th century it was up here or down there with places like Liverpool and Manchester, but has since fallen so far behind. And this is the excess that we're talking about. And this has been referred to in the case of Scotland as a Scottish effect or in the case of Glasgow as a Glasgow effect. It says in this slide, Q tedious rant, because when I have a longer presentation I usually spend three or four minutes ranting about how this is a very unhelpful term and how none of us should ever use it. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do the full rant today, but I will just say that when we published our report last year, uh, I spoke to a number of journalists and explained to them why these are unhelpful terms and they shouldn't use them and asked them not to use it in the coverage of the report. And it was fabulous to see how they responded by not using it apart from in every single piece of coverage that there was. Still mustn't be bitter. Anyway, so if we're talking about an, un uh, an unexplained higher level of mortality, What's the explanation? Well, I think it's fair to say that over the years there's been no shortage of theorising. Uh, this is a very, very old slide of mine. And theories have ranged, I won't read these, these all out, but theories have ranged from artefactual explanations, i.e. it is about poverty and deprivation being worse and driving higher mortality, but we're not measuring it properly, we're not capturing the differences properly. So an artefact of measurement, if you like. Uh, all the way through lots of stuff down to more kind of crazy bonkers suggestions about it's the weather, you know, because it rains a lot, we're all miserable, so we drink and we fall over and we die and that kind of thing. And you may think that's an unhelpful suggestion, but it's probably not the most unhelpful. And because this stuff got in the media over the last few years, it prompted lots of people to get in touch to tell us what they thought was driving higher mortality in Scotland. And again, I won't read these out, but these are genuinely proposed explanations. If I had to pick a favourite, maybe bottom left, maybe bottom right, or maybe top Right, I can never quite decide. Anyway, some of this nonsense was um, propagated by appalling coverage again in the media, uh, and I can go on about that at, at, at great length as well, but I'll give you one quick example, and this was from The Economist magazine, who did a piece on the Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester comparisons now five years ago. And in discussing why Glasgow had such a worse health profile than these two similar English cities, they concluded that it is as if a malign vapour rises from the Clyde at night and settles in the lungs of sleeping Glaswegians which is my favourite quote of this whole process. 
So, to bring some sense to what was becoming a nonsensical situation, what we did for this report we published last year was we assessed the merits, or otherwise, of no fewer than uh, 40 of the more plausible explanations that have been put forward. 40. What a laugh it was. And for every one of these theories, uh, we looked in the research literature to see, was there actually any evidence uh, linking this thing, this factor, to differences in population health? And if so, what did data for Scotland compared to the rest of Britain and for Glasgow compared to Liverpool and Manchester? Show. Did that support the suggestion that this thing, this theory, was playing a part in all this? So there are the 40 different theories, and again, I'm not going to uh, either read these out nor indeed keep this on the screen for any length of time, because I don't want to focus in this presentation on some of the many theories that this assessment process suggested were not playing a part, and instead focus on the ones that this process suggested were relevant. So the point here is that the explanatory model we came up with is evidence-based and not, as has been the case with this work for a number of years, speculation-based. I'm labouring that point, but it's quite an important one. So, in terms of this explanation for what's going on for, with, uh, with Glasgow, it was based on explicit comparison with Liverpool and Manchester, because for a number of reasons I don't have time to get into, they're very, very good comparator cities that relates to their histories and lots of other stuff. Uh, everything we did was embedded in what we understand about the important health determinants, and I won't insult this audience's in uh, intelligence by going on about that, but it's worth just highlighting that this included the explicit influence uh, on the health of political factors, and I'm emphasising that for reasons that will become apparent in a wee minute. And what came out of this whole process was a very, very complex set of factors, as it was always going to be. It was never going to be one thing or two things. It was going to be lots and lots of stuff. And in our report, we tried to summarise these many things in one diagram. I'm not entirely sure if we succeeded well or not, but in the report, it looks like this. Oh, hey. uh, so, uh, without reading any words, the point to note is there's lots and lots of stuff going on in there, and there's lots of connections between different things, because what emerged was a set of interrelated complex multiple factors that have influenced the situation. And what I'm going to do for the next five, ten minutes is just pick out maybe three or four examples to give you a flavour of what, as I said earlier, is a, is a longer, more complex story. So the first thing I'll mention is, is this idea of vulnerability, which has been uh, more and more frequently used in a public health setting recently. And from all this evidence, uh, we strongly argue that Glasgow's population has been made more vulnerable to the same important economic and political drivers of poor health as in Liverpool and Manchester, and therefore ending up in a worse place. To explain what I mean by that, I'm referring to things like deindustrialisation. So this is the loss of industrial employment over the 20th century. All three cities suffered disproportionately compared to the rest of Britain, but comparably so. Linked to that, uh, for similar levels of low-income-related deprivation, all three cities are the most deprived cities in the UK, but at a comparable level. And all three cities have, having been subject to the same UK government economic policies, which since 1979, and as you know, that's when that happened, uh, we've seen a widening inequality in income. Because of the links between income and health, we've seen a corresponding widening inequalities in health. And pol these policies have a particular adverse effect on places like Liverpool and Manchester and Glasgow. So all these things being similar, Glasgow's ended up in a worse place because it was already more vulnerable to these things. And this heightened vulnerability was created, the evidence shows, by the cumulative effects of a whole series of adverse historical factors, processes, events and decisions. And I'll give you a few examples of them right now. So the first thing I'll mention is that although the current socio-economic profiles of Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester are very, very similar, and although uh, long-term trends in low-income-based measures of poverty show the cities to have always been similar going back many, many decades, actually, historically, people in Glasgow were just living in worse conditions, as evidenced, for example, by much, much higher rates of overcrowding. These are overcrowded households. And this is still relevant to adult health today. So this is about the lagged effects, the delayed effects of historical levels of poor living conditions. And it's worth just stepping away from graphs just for a second to remind ourselves what we're talking about when we talk about those conditions that were, that were present in Glasgow at that time, what overcrowding looks like in reality in terms of, of the associated stresses, and why this is relevant to adult health then, but also to adult health today. The second thing I'll mention is that in part consequence of those worst living conditions, changes made to the city by local government in the post-war decades had a much more adverse effect on the city than in Liverpool and Manchester. So we're talking about the nature and scale of, of urban change in the post-war decades. 
And this relates to many, many different things, including a much larger scale of slum clearance and demolition, which is relevant because of the way it broke up communities. And in Glasgow, they demolished a lot more properties than in Manchester and certainly Liverpool. We're talking about building really, really poor quality peripheral housing schemes. This was done across Britain, but on a much larger scale in Glasgow, housing and affecting more people in absolute and proportionate terms, and certainly more than in the comparator cities of Liverpool and Manchester. We're talking about building a lot more multi-storey flats, and this is relevant because of the evidence in the research literature linking this type of high-rise living to negative impacts on mental health. And as you know, there are links between mental health and physical health. And proportionately, Glasgow built a lot more multi-stories, but an awful lot more very, very, very high multi-stories. But crucially, alongside all of this and other factors, is the fact that they just invested less money at key points in time in repairing and maintaining these properties. So again, for similar levels of low-income-based poverty in Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester, people were just living in worse housing conditions, representing a further layer of vulnerability. And this vulnerability is then enhanced by the third thing I'll mention, which was not about local government policy, but about UK government policy, or to be more precise and more accurate, Scottish office policy in those post-war decades. So as you all know, uh, before the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Office was the department of the UK government responsible for implementing uh, UK government policy in Scotland, but it also had very high levels of autonomy. And like the last uh, bit of research I mentioned, this was a new bit of work we commissioned to feed into a report, uh, and it was undertaken by colleagues whose names are on the screen, and was based on analysis of previously secret government documents made available uh, from the archives under the 30-year rule. And what these documents showed was that at this time, the Scottish Office recognised the major challenges facing Glasgow, but had no confidence that local government could solve these problems. And so they instead embarked on a series of policies that you can only really describe as writing off the city, as sacrificing the city. In these documents, Glasgow was officially designated as a declining city, and all economic investment was to be made away from the city. And as part of this process, industry and sections of the skilled population were moved away as well. So when they built the new towns to deal with the population overspill, the housing shortages, not everyone was allowed to move to a new town. You had to have a skill, you had to have a trade. They targeted particularly younger families with children, and there's an explicit mention in these documents to, quote, skimming the cream of the population. And indeed, if you fast forward to the 81 census and look at the social class composition of Glasgow and its two nearest new towns, this is the percentage of people in a low social class, so-called, they're quite radically different. If you do the same for Liverpool and the two new towns built to deal with that city's over overspill uh, problem, they're not different. So completely different things were happening in Glasgow. But the key and damning point is that these were policies that were extended and expanded over literally decades, despite very clear awareness at the time of the negative impact they were having on the city. So in our report, for example, we quote a Labour MP writing at the time saying, it's true that we're getting rid of some of our best tenants and leaving ourselves with this gap. And we are losing the capacity for leadership in the very communities which are creating the social problems. Excuse me. In the Scottish Office's own review of their overspill policy in a report tellingly entitled The Glasgow Crisis, they wrote, Glasgow is in a socially and economically dangerous position. It's becoming worse because although the rate of population reduction is acceptable, the manner of it is destined within a decade or so to produce a seriously unbalanced population with a very high proportion of the old, the very poor and the almost unemployable. Or in other words, a vulnerable population. So, in this quick whistle-stop tour of a few selected highlights of the story, we've had worse living conditions to start with, we've had a response by local government which has made the situation worse, and then a response by the Scottish Office which has exacerbated the problems even further. And the last of the four things I'll mention is by the time we get to the 1980s, there's yet more misery coming Glasgow's way. So this is when um, the UK government, the Conservative UK government, had come to power and were embarking on policies that I mentioned earlier that were having a particular effect on cities like Liverpool, and Manchester and Glasgow, industrial cities that were about to become post-industrial. And what this is about is about how local government in the cities responded to those challenges. This in itself is about a 40-minute presentation, so I'm only going to give you a very uh, quick outline. But the, the, the basic headline is that, in effect, 
in Liverpool and Manchester, they protected their populations a bit better than in Glasgow. So, for example, in Liverpool, there's a whole story of how they mobilised opposition against the UK government, how that resulted in widespread participation and politicisation of the public. And in response to that, local government gave much greater priority to dealing with the important issues of the day, to dealing with poverty, to building better and more affordable public housing, council housing. And indeed, if you look at council house building at the time, what was happening in Liverpool compared to, uh, was dwarfing what was happening happening in Glasgow. And indeed, what, everything that was going on in Glasgow was quite different, where there was a, a kind of business-led model of regeneration with a focus on inner-city gentrification, and in comparison, much less priority given to dealing with poverty and, and with the appalling living conditions of those stuck out on the peripheral estates who were, to a degree, ignored. And indeed, an assessment of all that evidence uh, shows that there are other protective effects in operation in the comparative cities, which again place Glasgow at a further relative disadvantage. And I don't have time to get into them, but some of that history around um, politicisation in Liverpool, for example, has led to much higher levels of what's so, uh, referred to as social capital or social fabric, which is known to be protective for population health. The final thing I'll just mention uh, before I finish is that... Um, Coming back to that issue of artefact, is that from an assessment of all this evidence, um, we do argue strongly that part of the explanation is an inadequate measurement of deprivation. So that is that all the studies to date have failed to uh, adequately capture differences in the lived reality of living in difficult circumstances in Glasgow compared to elsewhere, partly because it lies beyond routine measurement. And I think a lot of this historical stuff probably um, underlies some of the unmeasured aspects. In the report, we argue this very uh, kind of scientifically and systematically, uh, but just stepping away from that for a second, if you look at the causes of death linked to the excess, uh, the causes with the greatest relative differences, that is the particularly higher rates uh, in Glasgow, are around alcohol and drugs and suicide what we would refer to as the diseases of despair, if you like. In the case of alcohol and drugs, uh, coping mechanisms for people living in difficult circumstances in the case of suicide, I don't know, a non-coping mechanism, I suppose. So, on that cheery wee note, uh, I'm going to stop. Um, just to say there's lots of other things in that model, and I don't have time to get into them all, but hopefully that gives you a flavour of uh, some of the more, more important things that emerge from the evidence. In conclusion, health in Scotland, but particularly Glasgow, is characterised by extremely wide inequalities. Excess mortality plays a huge part in all that, and the scale of it is enormous. I haven't got into this today, but at the national level, it accounts for an, an additional 5,000 deaths every single year, which in a small country, that plays a massive uh, part in the whole sick man of Europe story and the widest inequalities in Europe story. We think we have identified the most likely underlying causes, and the report was endorsed by lots of leading figures in public health and other disciplines. The answer was always going to be complex and uh, multifactorial, and it is, but key to a large part of it, I think, is this idea of vulnerability uh, created by poor historical decisions, which therefore emphasises the importance of political and especially economic decisions for population health. I haven't got into this today, but the report includes 26 specific policy recommendations aimed at national and local government, which would have a beneficial impact. And actually, as I, as I speak, they're being actively ignored. Anyway, uh, just to quickly finish on one last, one last minute. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, versions of this presentation and I realised that by finishing with that slide on alcohol, drugs and suicide, I was profoundly depressing the population and possibly making the whole situation worse. So I started digging out a few slides from earlier presentations a few years ago just to finish on a slightly more upbeat note. And I'll just take 30 seconds to do that here if that's okay. And actually the one I dug out is entirely relevant because it relates to this whole story of the change from Glasgow as an industrial city built on shipbuilding and associated industries to one which is now effectively marketed as a shopping destination for tourists. And the marketing people use various slogans to attract people to Glasgow. Uh, if you've been to Glasgow recently, you know there's a big massive sign which says, people make Glasgow, whatever that means. Uh, but that's the current slogan. But about 10 years ago, uh, they had a previous slogan which was, Glasgow, Scotland with style. And at the time this slogan was out, we were producing a report with Carol, uh, which was highlighting the uh, scale of poverty and the scale of inequalities in poor health in the city. And I suggested that this next photograph that I'll show you could be the front cover of that report, but they wouldn't let me. On that, <laughs> on that note, I'll finish. Uh, if you want more details of the report, it's available online. Uh, thanks for your attention. David, uh, thank you so much. What a great way to start the morning. Um